We're going to go ahead and get started. So happy to have all of you this morning. My name is Abby Miles, and I'm the Member Relations Coordinator here at the Tulsa Chamber. And we're so excited to welcome to you, you guys to this two-part event featuring Tracy Spears and Wally Schmader. We're honored to have them with us today, but before we get started, I'd like to recognize our generous sponsors who make events like this possible. Our business behind the scenes sponsors are Exceptional Leaders Lab and M&M Lumber. Our women business leader sponsors are Cox Media Group, Jim Norton Chevrolet, OU Medicine, and Senate and Associates. Our small business benefactors are Exceptional Leaders Lab, Security Bank, Southwestern Payroll, and Web Branding. Our small business supporting sponsors are TEDC Creative Capital and Integrative Business Technologies. Again, I'd like to thank our generous sponsors for the, their support. The first half of today's event will be part of the Connections Business Behind the Scenes, and Tracy and Wally will provide some insight on their business journey and what they've learned along the way. The second half will be part of the Connections Women Business Leaders Programming and will include an interactive discussion on leadership during a crisis. All are encouraged to stay for the entire event. I'd also like to acknowledge some of the connection leadership that we have on the call with us today. Jerry Barrientos is the CEO and founder of First Mate Financial Advisors, and she's also the chair of the Connections Programming and Events Committee. Jerry, you want to give us a wave? Thanks so much for being here. Kathleen Pence is the owner of Pence Law Firm and is the chair of the Connections Diversity Committee. I want to thank both of them for helping us plan this event along with other Connection events. Kathleen, want to give us a wave? I saw you somewhere. There she is. Thank you both so much for your leadership. We appreciate you guys immensely. I'll now introduce our speakers. Tracy Spears is the founder of Exceptional Leaders Lab and Wally Schmader is the CEO of Exceptional Leaders Lab. Together, they have coached more than 100,000 professionals through keynotes, conferences, webinars, and broadcasts. Their powerful collective approach has helped professionals all over the world improve their leadership, or their leadership skills and their understanding of how they positively influence people and organizations. They have authored several books, including Exceptional Leaders Playbook and What Exceptional Leaders Know. Their new ebook is Leadership is a Verb. And if you were one of the first, excuse me, first 50 people to register, you will be sent a free copy of that ebook. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Tracy and Wally. Thank you guys. Thanks, Abby. I love seeing all these familiar faces uh, on the screen. So I really enjoy uh, the Zoom calls. And I'm super excited to introduce you to my business partner, Wally Schmader, because as I look at a lot of people on the screen, I know a lot of you have heard of him, but have never actually laid eyes on him. So he uh, is coming to us this morning from Norfolk, Virginia. And so this section's a little bit odd for us to talk about, you know, how we built our business. We're usually out talking about leading and, and thinking forward. And so when we got on the call the last couple of days to kind of look back on our journey, it's been, it's been kind of fun. Wally, I think a little painful too, yes? A little bit, it's fun to, the retrospective part was fun and we've never done a talk like this with a group like this. And while I don't have as many friends on the call as Tracy does, I do see a few and I'm happy to see you. Uh, I'm based in Virginia and we're always, you know, the audience that I would be most excited to, to deal with would be small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and of course, we're a big part of Tulsa, so it's great to be involved with anything uh, there. So very excited about it. And we've got an outline we're going to work off of and kind of go uh, a little bit like a, a fast-forwarded autobiography of the business. That, that's the idea. And we'll start with, with how we met. And uh, I'll put a little color in there. Tracy will be adding in, of course. So we met. We worked together for a very long time, 20-plus years in a corporate environment uh, for a very big company, and we never were living, we never lived in the same city. We were never on the same team. We just kind of uh, developed a mutual admiration for one another's skill sets, really. And uh, it was apparent to me very early in our relationship that Tracy's skill set and her talents, of course, were way too big for the role she was in. So early in our relationship, before we were even close friends, uh, I tried to nudge her along uh, on her with our leadership and our company to make sure she continued to get more and more responsibility. And of course, eventually she had almost all the responsibilities you can imagine uh, at our company. So it was really interesting watching her grow up and 
become the person you've all gotten to know and, and uh, develop that speaking style and that very relatable way of presenting that she's got. I got to see all of that firsthand. I, I've seen Tracy in front of audiences of, wait for it, two, <laughs> and audiences with thousands, of course. So it's, it's been a blast. So how do you remember all that, Tracy? That was good. Let's keep going on that. No, yeah. I, I, listen, <laughs> I will say this, that, you know, I was fortunate and one of the recommendations would always be that you find somebody that, you know, we call them sponsors. We call them people that um, are kind of in your corner. And Wally was always that for me, right? As women in business, um, as you can imagine, I, you know, I was oftentimes the only female there. And, and the fact that Wally was paying attention and and trying to say, hey, wait a minute, I don't shrink in this moment. And he was, he really sponsored me. So I'm super grateful for that. And that, that really turns into, um, over time, this amazing business partnership. And so, as he said, you know, we, in, in this company that we were in, there were 143 physical offices and um, they were all entrepreneurial based offices. Said differently, we were full commission salespeople, or I was for uh, 25 years. And so I was in that, you know, you eat what you kill. And our, our uh, plan was that we had to grow high-performing teams. And so while I was the person mostly on the streets, Wally, thank goodness, was the person that was creating the curriculum. He was thinking about, you know, what, it, what it, the services that we provide and really putting together strategically the plan. And so you can tell already in the first four minutes of this call, he's the perfect partner for me. And hopefully uh, I have been for him as well, but we won't talk about that. Um, so, so in that, what we, we had this also front row seat to watch these, in, these franchises, if you will, some of them be uberly successful and some of them not be very successful. And they had the same business plan. They had the same opportunity, um, sometimes even the same market. And so we would go in and we would spend some time in those organizations and, and we would look at everything from the very beginning of, you know, what happens when a phone call comes in to the services on the other side. And so, as you can imagine, that becomes our incubator of leadership. And no surprise here, the offices that were really successful, the difference between that and the ones that weren't, it, it always came down to leadership and a few things that we're going to talk about today. So, Wally, what do you, what do you want to add to that? Uh, just, I mean, it was really a case study to watch. I don't know how many of you, how many of you work in companies that have branches or divisions or regions that are, that are separate and that can work kind of autonomously? Okay, so you know, they can, they can run and be completely different. And it, it's strange. You got the same market you're selling into, the same services or products that you're selling, and they can become completely different businesses based on the priorities of that leader or the skills of that leader. So it really was an interesting time. I can't imagine a, a more formative um, situation to, to be in. And of course, you know, a lot of leadership, a lot of the top leaders you'll meet come from sales because sellers are in the persuasion business and leadership is about persuasion and influence. So how many of you have come from some kind of sales in your background to get to where you are today? That's important, right? So we'll talk about that later. Uh, influence is leadership. You can make a strong argument for, for that and that you can make a strong argument for, for being very active in the way that you learn how to influence people. So watching Tracy and her approach to this is really useful for me and it helped us realize what we needed to do to start to reproduce that same kind of leadership skill set in, in different people. So one of the things that happened along the way was um, I got a call from Tracy where she was saying, hey, I, I like your, I've written a book and I like your book. Why don't we work together on a book? I've always wanted to write a book. Now, how many of you know the relationship between the number of people that want to write a book and the number of people that write a book? Raise your hand. It's a lot, right? <laughs> so everybody thinks they have a book in them, which is, which is inspiring and can also be a little bit uh, frustrating, right? Because not everybody, and I see Jane Mudgett is on this call and she is a force of nature when it comes to, to writing. And so I'm a writing coach. I've had a chance to work with a lot of people. Most people that want to write a book never even write the first page of that, of that book. But Tracy was different. She was very persistent. She goes, I've been working on ideas. I've got a folder full of things. And so um, before I talk about how we actually decided to, how we were going to alternate in our relationship to get this book produced. Tracy, do you want to add anything more about those early conversations, the exploratory conversations? Yeah, you totally blew me off. That's what I would add. Like, you, <laughs> you know, you did. You were like, yeah, okay, okay. And like for a year or two, I was like, no, seriously, I really want to write a book. And you finally said, then do something about it. And so, I, and I'll just tell you when this company formed, and we're, we're going to get into Exceptional Leaders Lab, um, he already had a super successful book, um, you know, long before I came uh, along. And 
he had these uh, this opportunity to go, you know, do a, a national book tour and all that. And he said, oh, no, 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 I don't want to sell books. I just want to write books. I was like, oh, I don't want to write a book. I want to sell books. So, so we had this, you know, um, I think synergy, if you will. And so when we did finally put it uh, to paper and started, you know, going down the path to do that, um, you know, and I think all of you, hopefully all of you know this, that, that that turns into be something, you know, pretty special for us. And after, what was it, I think two years back and forth, um, we started Exceptional Leaders Lab around that same time, really as, I don't know, it, it would kind of be where the butch book was going to be launched. And so in that, we really had to have, you know, like, well, well what are we going to do? What if that does tank off? So that's what I would add to your yeah. work. Okay. Well, let's, so this is a good Let's think for a second. I want to ask all of you. So one of the things in, in reaching your potential or finding your success or becoming who you want to be is to find people along the way that can give you a nudge, right? That can give you a push into an uncomfortable place, uh, but in a way that's trusting and loving. So how many of you have found someone professionally in your life? A lot of you have personally, but raise your hand if you found someone professionally who can give you that kind of nudge to do something maybe you wouldn't have done without them. Okay. So really important. And if you're not someone who, who got to raise their hand there, think about that. I'll, I'll bet you that person is in your orbit already. They're in your life and, and ready to work, but they're the one that needs to be asked, right? I mean, that, that's the way it happens sometimes. And that's the way it happened with us. And so we found that with the, we decided to write the book together and we actually uh, were so autonomous. And this ends up being the way that we work. We say we work together, but actually we don't do any of the same things. Trace and I have no overlap in what we do, which is amazing in a partnership. So even in this book, we're supposed to be writing together, we're alternating chapters. I did one, she did two, I did three, she did four, I did five, she did six, and then we'd get together every week and share the chapters. So here's what I did, what'd you do? And when you read the book, it kind of reads like that. You can read, you can tell if you've read What Exceptional Leaders Know, um, you'll recognize Tracy chapters and you'll recognize, and hers have all the exclamation points and dots and parent parentheses, and you'll recognize Wally chapters, they look like they came from an English major who wants to, to get everything grammatically correct. So you probably like Tracy's better, most people do. But that's how we started. And so we launched this book and we had this um, surprising success that, that required the formation of this company. So that, that's where Exceptional Leaders Lab comes from. But what I want you all to take from that is the, 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 the idea is the partner that challenge you, challenges you to do something you wouldn't have done. Right, that's the takeaway there. Not we wrote a book, but we found each other. So Tracy, what would you add? No, just you know, in the beginning. So this is five years ago, um, and we want to talk about you know our mistakes and learnings. I know, you know, we're kind of going on and on about a book, but the business uh, side of this was, I think, you know, when we jumped in and said, okay, let's let's form a company, um, we were accidental in that it ends up being what it is now. So let's kind of, you know, go back to some of those things. And, and I, and I, and Wally, I, I know that you um, wanted to talk a little bit about partners and how we bring people into the organization, but I want you to know this as a small business in the very beginning, and everybody does know this. I mean, you have to roll your sleeves up. You have to put in the shoe leather. You have to create the right connections. You do have to bring the right people um, to help you along with your journey. And we've been so fortunate to have so many amazing business partners. As I look even on this screen, uh, a lot of you are showing up on the screen. And so um, when, when we did make that transition from corporate America into Exceptional Leaders Lab full time, it was, we, you know, we stumbled into it a little bit. It happened a little bit faster than we wanted it to happen. Um, said differently, we uh, both got fired from that company that we were working for uh, on the same day at the same time. And so uh, literally I am on, I'm on the call and, and we were bought by another company. So it was a, it was a mergers and acquisitions. We knew it was coming. Um, it came actually a year later than we thought it was going to happen. And so when they wait a year to do it, you're like, oh, maybe we've made it through. And so the day that it came, I sent him, we won't, I can't tell you all the texts that we sent back and forth that day, but I said, I'm totally getting fired right now. He replied back, me too. And that was it. So Exceptional Leaders Lab was a thought, it was a place for, you know, around the book, but it became a full on business that moment because we were like, all right, we know what to do. We know how to make this business go. And so uh, I don't, we, we won't go into any more details of that. You wanna do the biggest mistakes of learnings, Wally? No, I want to talk about that moment. So uh, that was, and I want you all to think about this. So Daryl, Courtney, Kim, Kuma, Ashley, Jackie, Bailey, Lindsay, that's the make or break moment, right? Where you have to decide to go forward, 
sideways, right? And we've all, uh, you're going to have this if you haven't have it already, where you have to make the big decision. Like, okay, do I pull my chips off the table now? Or is this the moment to do my thing? Or is this the moment to, to go sideways or what? How many of you feel like you've had your, your make or break moment professionally already, or at least the first one? Okay. You know it when it happens, right? So if you're not sure, you haven't had it. it it's coming. And it'll be a big decision and there's a lot of risk involved and you have to sort of become somebody new to say yes to the opportunity. So the easiest thing for both of us would have been just to go into another corporate role like the one we came from, but um, neither of us did that. So, and, and these moments are uh, impossibly dramatic. Like I had to sell a house, we had a beach house, I had to sell a car, to sell some investments, I had to get lean, my wife had to start a business. So this is no joke, you know, serious real world kind of decision making to, to, to take this shot uh, that we thought we had. So I wanted to all, Tracy said it was accidentally, yes it was, but once you get there, you've got to be very, very intentional. And if you're an entrepreneur and starting something, you already know that. So Tracy, anything to add to that? We did the same thing. Rosemary and I uh, start, you know, so, sold a bunch of rental property. We, we got super lean and thought, okay, we, we need a year or two um, of a ramp up here so that, you know, we, we can not, you know, have to worry about somebody has got to go get, you know, a different job. So, and I think everybody on this call, anybody that's in the small business world has had that, you know, uh, happen to them for sure, because it, there are times and it's cyclical where things are great, things aren't great. And you have to figure out how to navigate some of those times as well. So, yeah. And this COVID-19 moment has been a make or break moment for a lot of us, right? So for many of us, you're having those conversations you have to have, like, what's the least I can possibly live on? Right. You don't just bring that up with nothing happening to you. Right. How many of you have had a conversation like that in your life? Like, what's the, yeah, get the pencil out. Right. So um, that's how it is to start anything new or come out of something else. And of course, you end up being stronger and smarter. So let's talk about uh, some of these mistakes we made. And these are ones that we hope are instructional. And then we'll talk about some of the recommendations we would have um, based on some learning. So I'll start with, let's just alternate on these, Tracy. So the first one, we, we definitely, we're too confident in our content. We've worked a lot on content development. We had some really good stuff. Uh, to this day, I'm probably too confident in our content that it would market itself. And so we un underemphasized marketing, which is weird because we came from sales. That was our background. So we definitely didn't level up on our marketing horsepower early enough. And so that would have been, a, we would have redistributed our energy and our money probably differently on that. Uh, take the next one, Tracy. Yeah, I would say we had a lot of arguments about that too as business partners um, and, and you debate those things. I think one of the hardest questions to answer for a small business is how much money should we spend on marketing? And the time that you need marketing is when the money's not coming in, right? So it's, it's this interesting relationship. Um, and then we chose partners that probably weren't the right partners for us for whatever reason. Um, you know, you want to have people that are committed to your mission. You want to have people that are all in. Uh, we've had the fortune of having some of those partners as well. But I do think that was probably uh, in the beginning, we needed to be a little bit more discriminating about you know, how we wanted to grow our business. In the beginning, we were like, oh, let's just grow. Let's just, let's do the spray and pray method, right? Let's just you know, throw all this stuff out there and hopefully something will catch fire. So we could have been and should have been much more strategic in the beginning of that. We still find ourselves in that situation, by the way, because we have a lot of things that we're interested in and a lot of things that, you know, a lot of shiny objects, uh, you know, that we like to go down some of those different paths. So that would, those would probably be a couple of things. Um, and then I'll, I'll start the next one. Um, one of the things that I would say we did finally do is we got really good at staying in our lanes. Like I know what is, is my role in this partnership. And Wally knows what his role is in the partnership. And when you, when you have um, those so clearly defined, Nancy Gunter, uh, I've spent a lot of time with her around strength finders recently, but that you, you have to, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, you've got to do the things you're really, really good at. And you have to delegate the rest. You have to hire people and you have to put amazing people on your team so that they can do the things that they're really good at. And they have to do them, right? So I would say that was probably one of our biggest mistakes is we tried to do too much on our own in the beginning. We finally bring Melissa Siemens in. I know Rosemary's done a lot of work. We, we have, you know, um, when we delegate something, we, I think we're pretty good. Melissa might argue with us, but we're like, okay, somebody go, go do that. What would you add to that one? Uh, no, I don't think I, I wouldn't change any of that. That's any, it's weird how you have to specialize first in order to get known. And then you have to generalize in order to continue to be of service. And so we had one thing that Tracy got, got known for, right? It was the, the book 
and then the talk around temperaments and she built a brand around that. But then you, you've already done that talk. So we, we realized we had to start to muscle up on our, on our content and also find subject matter experts and specialists that would help us in the areas of growth where we wanted to go. So Rosemary Harris was the first, then Melissa Siemens comes in, we can't do the things she does, then Kirsten Lowry, then Terry Buskey, then Jane Mudgett, then Nancy Gunter, then Jackie Cleary. These are all people that have areas of, of expertise and a few of them are in, in Tulsa, luckily, that we don't have. And so I think you acknowledge, and we all have heard that, right? Play to your strengths. But I think you also have to acknowledge your weaknesses and say, okay, if we can find somebody who just knows a lot more about that stuff than we do and bring them in, we're more valuable as an organization. So that's all I would add to that. And that, that for us, and staying in our lanes for, for me and Tracy is a very specific thing. And the way we always tell the story is, um, how many of you ever heard of Bernie Toppin? Raise your hand. Really? Three people? Thank you, Daryl. Somebody. So Bernie Toppin is, for, for the rest of the world, the other 98.9% is the songwriter for Elton John. Okay, so Elton John puts on the big glasses, puts on the furs, puts on the, the uh, elevator shoes, and walks out there and does the thing, right? And we all love it, and we're inspired, and we clap, and we stand up. Uh, and Bernie Toppin stays at home and writes these great songs that we all know. Uh, guess who's Bernie in our relationship? Anybody? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's our, th those are our lanes. And I'm happy to be it. I would never want to be the Elton in our relationship. And I know Tracy would sooner croak than, than be the Bernie. So those are our lanes. And that's the way we think about them. It, wor it works for us. Um, so let's talk about some, some recommendations. Unless you have anything to add there, Tracy, I'd like to get on the recommendations before we run out of time. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that, you know, I, I, I want to make sure this point is made that when you do recognize and know what your strengths are, especially in small businesses, you can't get pulled off track to be doing things that you can hire other people to do. You have to do the thing that you are so gifted at doing. You, you have to be able to have the energy to do that. And I can tell you when, when we were trying to do it all, um, that took energy that, you know, that created um, a little bit of an energy uh, depletion so that then when it was time to do the things that we were really, you know, passionate about, we didn't have that. So I just, I want to make sure that that, that point is made. Yeah. So that, that, that's a great transition. Into, so the three biggest recommendations we have as we run out of our time here is focus on what makes you unique. There's something you know, there's something you care about, there's something you're passionate about, there's something that just is really close to you that isn't that close to anybody else and you have a different understanding of it. That would be uh, the, the thing. And we all know what it is, right? This is my thing. And for those of you on the call that I know, and Tracy knows a lot more, we, we know those things for you. And that, that's where you begin to build a personal brand and then a professional brand out of that. The second thing is decide on core values. And this starts with personal core values. And of course that ends up being professional and business core values. And you know, I think if the COVID-19 is teaching us anything, it's the value of core values because they end up being your, and we'll talk about this, our compass when the, the seas are rough, right? When the white water shows up around all of us, you need something, right? To be your rudder. And uh, that's what core values can be. So what would you add to that, Tracy? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think for sure that, you know, you have to have that. You also have to have um, one of the other recommendations I'm going to throw in here is um, the right partners, right? As we've talked a little bit about that, we've, uh, and we were partnering with different people along the way. That's, that certainly adds to that as well. And those core values, by the way, are not just an exercise that people come in and you go, oh, let's do core values. You have to make your decisions based on those core values, right? You have to actually say, hey, wait a minute. If one of our core values is be easy to do business with, which ours is, that means you can't have a 25 page contract. It means you can, there's things that you just, you can't do. You want people to be able to have that, ex, that you know, easy to do business with experience. So I do think it, it drives a small business forward. And it's nice when somebody, a customer, a client comes in and they know what your core values are. They can just tell, like you, if I told you what ours were, hopefully you would go, oh yeah, totally. That's, that's our experience, right? Yeah. All right, we've got a couple of, just a couple of minutes left. So uh, how many of you have, uh, core values personally or family core values that you, you think you're pretty well attached to. Okay, nice. How about corporate where, where you work at, at your work? There's core values. Okay, so useful, right? And I think the core values that go up on the wall on the nice shiny plastic or go on the desk or on the, the poster, those are not the ones we're talking about. We're, we're talking about the ones you live, right? And we'll talk a lot more. The book we're going to send you, and this is the last recommendation we'll have, is called Leadership is a Verb. And it's an ebook. It's 100 pages. You'll read it in an hour. And there's some stuff in there about core values, but it mostly, you know what it is? It's sort of the greatest hits of what our 
our audiences and partners and clients have told us has been the most help to them. So we hope that you enjoy that and you'll, you'll receive that later. Uh, Abby can fill you more in on, on that. But we're anxious to get your feedback on that. We're anxious to get that in your hands and it'll tell you a lot more about some of these things we're, we'll be talking about today. So Tracy, what else? Let's see, I, I guess the, the only thing I would just add is, um, you know, it's, it's hard in, in 30 minutes to tell a story that could convey um, all the things that happened to help us be where we are right now. But I will say this, all the things that happened to help us be where we are has been those of you that are on the screen and the amazing uh, people that have, have engaged with our organization. And we're just very super grateful. Um, we're, you know, it's been fun to watch this little business in the last five years grow grow up and you know to bring on some partners and to have some really uh, you know big clients I think a lot of you know we uh, have partnered with another company that takes me internationally so we do a lot of work with international clients and what's the best part about all of that is that when you're in some of those other organizations the things that I get to learn and bring that back and then that becomes part of exceptional leaders lab material as well so um, that's our last core value by the way is to stay relevant it would be, doesn't matter what kind of, you know, business you're running, if you don't stay relative, if you don't stay innovative, if you don't keep thinking about the customer experience, um, you're going to become obsolete. And we've watched a lot of businesses, uh, we've, we've watched that happen. Um, and, I, and I think one of the, the benefits of COVID, and we'll talk about a business in a crisis in this next section, but it's been an opportunity to sit back and say, hey, wait a minute, we need to make a pivot. We need to figure out what can we be doing? It's, it's this, this great opportunity um, and can be, and we've uh, hopefully taken advantage of that. So we're all of a sudden a virtual leadership training company. Uh, you know, that's been fun. There's a couple of big lights, like we've like immediately started investing. And I know those are the pivots that a lot of you have made on this call as well. So I think with that, we'll bring Abby back in. I can't believe that, that, that time flew. So Abby, you wanna tee up the next section? Absolutely. That was excellent. I know you guys could take probably a day and tell your story, but condensing it into 30 minutes, that was excellent. Thank you both for sharing that behind the scenes look at Exceptional Leaders Lab. So yes, we will transition into our last half, our last hour of today. As everyone knows, any crisis puts a spotlight on leadership, decision-making, and communication. Tracy and Wally will now lead an interactive discussion about leadership during a crisis. Take it away. All right, Tracy. Yeah, so as we're talking about already, um, this, you know, the, the COVID and a crisis, we've had like the biggest crisis. We can see all your slides, which is good, Wally. It's perfect. Uh, it's perfect. And um, when we started thinking about what has to change in the messaging that we have coming, you know, um, through what's about to happen. And so I think a lot of you know, we had a little bit of a, a hiccup in that, you know, I was, uh, I actually had COVID. So we, we had about a three week late start to this, but in the middle of that, as Wally, you know, was talking to clients and putting things together. And we've continued to do that through our client conversations. And so we wanted to give you six keys to leading in a crisis. Um, and I'm gonna let Wally start it off with number one. Yeah, we're just looking at the first slide, right? Nope, but that's all right. It's not all right with me, let's see. <laughs> Very strange, okay, how about now? It's good enough, let's roll. All right, okay, well let's roll our sleeves up. It's not showing me presentation mode for some reason. So we're gonna do a couple things. We're gonna go through this quickly and there's a lot of takeaways here. So I'm gonna uh, warm up your, your pens or pencils. So we're gonna have a few, three breakout sessions around certain questions that you need to be asking yourself today. And um, I'm gonna try once more on the... <laughs> screen share because it'll be a different experience in this way. So it's a no go brother. All right, no go? No. Okay. Let's go. So six keys. Number one, be proactive in your leadership. And we're going to talk about exactly what this means. There's two different ways to go here and you got to go the right way. So first, proactive responses are making sure you and your team are as agile as possible in this moment. You're going to be making decisions quickly. Do you remember weeks were feeling like months for a while? And now it seems like every day is going by quicker than, than it's ever gone by before. So everything is upside down. I know it's that way in Oklahoma. It's certainly that way in Virginia. Uh, every mistake you're going to make as a leader uh, through COVID, through this crisis, is going to be a mistake made on the side of, of not being decisive. And so we'll talk about that. This is a moment, and every moment brings to the surface different leadership traits that become more important. Decisiveness is what's coming to the surface during this one. 
So you want to think through opportunities that are going to arise. You want to demonstrate your core values through this crisis. On the reactive side, uh, showing your anger, showing your frustration, especially if you're a leader who's been entrusted to lead, this is not the moment for that. Uh, feeling sorry for yourself, you know, we're all going through the same thing. You just heard Tracy refer to her COVID-19 experience as a hiccup. Well, it almost killed her, right? So this is going to change the way that we see things. So feeling sorry for yourself doesn't, doesn't apply. Um, you saw this early in the crisis. You see a little bit of it now, people denying the gravity of this, not taking it seriously enough, uh, looking out for themselves first. This is not the time for that. That's forgetting your core values, and this is when they're needed most. So no guessing allowed. You've got to fully vet all your decisions. Leadership is the rudder, like we talked about in moments like this. Your core values are your compass. Your regrets are going to come from inaction, and we're going to change a familiar cliche, shoulda, coulda, did. This is the moment to be decisive in your leadership. So with that, we go to number two. Tracy? I love that. Shoulda, coulda, did. And you're going to have to scroll up, brother. I can't see anything there. But I do know that I'm going to cover number two, which are the uh, grow, don't shrink. And so in, in that grow, don't shrink, this is, um, it's been fun from our perspective to sit back and watch what happens to people in this moment. And I bet that even on people in your team, in your organization, there have been people that have completely surprised you by coming up with whether it's a new skill set or a new enthusiasm for you know, what's going on. And there's probably been people that are so, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do it differently because this is the way we've always done it. And so number two, I, I think this one's a big one and it's, it is that opportunity to say, you know what, I need to reinvent myself. I need to very quickly make a pivot in a way that is um, you know, gonna be gonna help my organization. And you know, for small businesses, if the leader doesn't make that transition, if the leader um, sits around and waits too long, I'll go back to Wally's point. And then with Wally's point saying that you have to be super decisive. If you aren't able to do that in this moment, you can set your business back, you know, uh, 30 days, 60 days, you can set it back to, you know, a really, a really bad place. Now I can see your whole desktop. Um, all right, so here are the six things you have to give up. Number one, you have to give up um, the need to be right. And so I think in, in you know, the environment that we're in right now, that's, that's really hard because we have known our business for so long and we've had this situation where, you know what, I know what's, what's about to happen and I, I understand you know, the decisions that I have to make and I'm in some kind of a rhythm. And so in doing that, you have to look at everything differently and go, you know what, I, I don't need to, to you know, be right. I just need to get stuff done. And so doing that differently. Number two, and this is, you know, you, you have to give up the gossip and guess, guessing. I would say that any leader should give this up. But I think you do have to be willing to, um, you know, do a little bit more investigation. You have to, you can't just take things at face value. You have to a little bit, be a little bit more strategic about that. Number three, and this is something all leaders have to give up, and, but it's definitely right now is you, you can't sit around and, and say, hey, wait a minute, is, is everybody noticing how well I'm navigating this crisis? Um, I've watched leaders completely negate their power by having an external locus of control and by waiting for other people to tell them that they're doing an amazing job. And I want to say this, you know, leadership is a thankless business. You see that on the screen. But I, I, I want to make sure everybody understands that the higher you go to an organization, running an organization, nobody's saying thank you, right? Nobody's saying you're crushing it. It's implied. And so it's almost a veiled compliment when you don't get a lot of praise. So just make sure you hear that. Number four, you have to give up distractions. And I, you know, Wally and I have this conversation all the time. I'm a multitasker. I like to do a lot of things at once. Um, and I, I think that those distractions are exactly that, you know, especially in a, in a time of crisis. You have to figure out of the hundred balls that you're juggling, what are the four that you are not going to drop? And when we do take on clients, that's one of the things that, you know, we spend a lot of time on is what are you not going to do? Because especially right now, you need all of your energy to be focused towards, you know, making some of these pivots that, are, that need to be made. So I would be really, really, um, you know, mindful of where you're spending your energy right now. Do an energy audit, do a, you know, a calendar audit, you know, look and say, you know, what are some of the, the meetings I can uh, mark off? Number five, attachment to what the, you know, old normal, if you will, was. Because I do think that, you know, what has happened will forever be changed. 
you know, I can tell you our, our company is forever changed. We will never go back to the exceptional leaders lab that we were before the COVID crisis. It's forced us to be a little bit more innovative. It's forced us to look at things differently. And so if your attachment is, oh, I can't wait to get through this so that we can go back to business as usual, you've missed a really important lesson during this crisis. And so I would cheer you on to think differently about that. And then the last thing is excuses. Um, things you have to give up in a crisis. That, that, that's you know, certainly one of those um, you know, opportunities. We can't say, oh, well, that was because of COVID or that may, maybe that's the case, but what did you do in reaction to or response to what's happened? That's where the magic is. The magic is what new skill are, is your business, you know, did you learn for your business? What new way of marketing? How did you make that pivot in a way so that you could continue to stay relevant? So those are the six things that you have to give up during a crisis. And um, I'll just end it with this and we'll go to our first breakout section. And I love this graphic because it just talks about, you know, presence in a way that you have to have amazing presence right now for your people. Because if you are, you know, oh my gosh, the, the, you know, the sky is falling. You're the person that's going to normalize. Can we get through this? Is everybody going to be freaked out because you as the leader are freaked out? You can be freaked out, but don't be freaked out in front of your team, right? Don't be freaked out in front of your customers. Don't be freaked out you know, in, in a you know, meeting where people are looking to you to steady the ship. So it's this, this combination of competence and experience with confidence and demeanor, and it's grounded, as you see on the graphic, in empathy, right? You have to also, in the middle of this, you can't act as if people aren't going through a tough time. They are. You have to be able to meet them where they are. And that, that foundation is what creates um, what I would say is, a, is amazing presence. Wally, would you add anything to that? Just that. No, it tells the story. And the, the empathy part becomes more important because even if, imagine you're the leader in an organization, people are going through amazing stuff. I mean, their relatives are. I mean, my whole family has been laid off except for myself. And so if you're not sensitive to that stuff or if you've got somebody sick that you're having to deal with, you know, it's going to show up a lot more this time. So I think that was really well said. It brings us to our first breakout question. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. And I'm a little bit of a novice here, so Abby's gonna guide us. We're gonna send uh, everyone into two different breakout rooms. I'll go with one uh, room and Wally, Wally will go with the other. But let's have a little conversation about what you have learned about yourself during this crisis. Because if we don't at least kind of get in touch with some of those things, where have you, you know, I'm really good at this, or you know what, I'm not so good at this. So let's do our breakout rooms. Abby, help us out. Oh my gosh, we could have stayed in that room for a while. How about you? Yeah, ours was great. We had some really interesting things and the introverts had a lot to say uh, about, um, well, actually extroverts were saying how hard it was gonna be and they did better than they thought. And the introverts said, well, maybe I'm not completely an introvert. I do like having people around. So we had a good little conversation about that. Our, our big takeaway was uh, time will promote you or expose you. Like when I was thinking about, we had um, a lot of people talk about listening and just that they that they realize that is a superpower yeah. and it forced us into be better listeners for sure. So, um, but the time will promote your exposure. I do think that hits kind of what we were talking about in that list is that we've been able to, it's, it's crystallizes, uh, it crystallizes people's um, fortitude, I think through a crisis like this. So this has been, that's been fun. All right. All right. So what are we looking at? Can we see a screen or no? Just see, just see you. Wow. And it's and, right. and we're going to my favorite part, understanding how high performing teams work. Okay. So how what do we see now? The number one slide. All right. So this is working out fantastically well. Let's see. It's like we practice. I got it. We're good. Give me a second. Okay. I'm Hold totally on. gonna start telling stories about you. So don't do it. All right. All right. How about now? Oh, it has to start at the beginning. Wow. All right. I'm just going to click it through. Every time. Here's your review already. <laughs> this is not how this usually works. Okay. Next is understanding how high performance teams actually work. And this is going to be a, a twist from what we're used to talking about on this kind of stuff. I'm going to say some things that you haven't heard before. So uh, let's, let's talk this through. So first, we all grew up as managers and leaders, imagining our pools, our team as pools, meaning that we felt like we used words like retention, we use words like seniority, and we use them with really positive connotations, right? Um, we bragged about the number of people I did uh, that I had that have been around for five, 10 years. <clears throat> and we thought of it as, as our job to kind of be the lifeguard, right? We want everybody safe and we want them to stay in the pool. 
as long as they possibly can. But the truth is that that's not really how high performance teams work. And a lot of us are discovering that in this moment as our teams change, right? With layoffs and furloughs and virtual work and remote access. Uh, it's really the stream team that is the performing team. Uh, often the pool team is not a high performing team at all. People can get stagnant. They can be averse to change. How many of you have had the experience of, of having people on your team that were not agile enough, that were not able to pivot into a new situation, either based on a, a technical limitation uh, or just a, a in being inflexible. We've all seen it, right? So here's how stream, stream teams work. A stream team is focused on having the right people in the right roles at the right time, right? And that's exactly how high-performing teams work, uh, whether you're talking about a sports team or a business team. So here's an example of a, of a team changing forms as it goes through its development. A startup team, the team that drove the the expansion, the COVID team, right? We had to get down to a small sort of war room team for a while. The smart, lean, agile relaunch team that helped us come out when the light turned green again. The team that brought us to market leadership. So you've got a team story that's a stream uh, in your organization. And to think of it that way is useful in two ways. It's useful to give you some context for some tough decisions you might've had to make. And it's very useful for your people understanding what's happening in the context for some of the tough decisions that they're seeing you make as a leader. So hopefully that makes sense. So the next thing I want to talk about under this one is the two opposing forces exist in every organization. You have it in yours, we have it in ours. And it's the inertia of the organization and it's the leadership of the organization. And a lot of times these are uh, at odds, right? They're, they're against each other in a lot of organizations for reasons that you'll immediately recognize. Organizational inertia is built on how we've always done it around here, right? This is just how we do it and how it was where I worked before and what I do when nobody's looking, right? And leadership is focused on today's issues, today's challenges, what's happening right now, uh, the confidence that you have in the team capability and the team's ability to grow and having reliable measures of performance, right? What does success even look like for us? So one of the silver linings of COVID-19, and there aren't very many, but one of them is in crisis, these things are aligned in many organizations. All of a sudden, maybe for the first time, organizational inertia and leadership are pointed the same direction in an amazing way, just because everybody's having to be so decisive and having to work so closely together. So hopefully you're experiencing that in your organization. It's a really big deal. So we with that, yeah, oh, yeah, I, yeah I, just, I just want to jump in for a second because I, th I think that people on this call, so there's, there's two, we're, we're serving two different, we're the, the business owner that is, you know, trying to figure out as you make that transition to maybe a leaner team, but also you have a decision to make. Are you going to just stay in the pool or are you going to reinvent yourself, right? That was the, the conversation going on in our room um, a second ago was, you know, time promotes you or exposes you in, an, in this kind of an environment and people have to make new decisions right now. And I think there are a lot of people that don't take the time to make those decisions about who they want to be three months from now, three years from now. And they do just kind of go along. And so when I see that, you know, I, I can tell you, Wally, there have been times I've been drowning in that pool, right? Just going, hey, I, you know, I stayed in an organization, probably we could argue longer than I should have, um, but I was comfortable. Uh, you know, I, you know, I didn't want to risk leaving the pool. Um, but I think in something like this, and it happened to us, the merger, an acquisition, you know, came along and it was like, all right, everybody out of the pool. And I, I do think that if you thought about that, not just during a time of crisis, how do you stay relevant to the organization? How, how do you make sure that you're building the, your muscles in a way that, you know, is, is going to move an organization forward? So I think the leader oftentimes doesn't take the time to do that because they're so busy. They're working more hours than anybody else. The small, when I think of the small business owner and how much time it takes, um, you know, to, to even keep all the balls in the air, it's, it's hard sometimes to step back and reinvent yourself. So I think it's been a great thing about this is that we get to reinvent ourselves as being part of that team. So, and while you had something about sports teams that I thought was really good, but I can't remember what it was. Well, it's, I don't know how many of you have watched the, uh, I forget what it's called. Oh, the last, is it the last dance? The last dance, the Michael Jordan documentary. Some of you have been watching that. So it's almost a case study in the stream team idea in that it was clear that the initial team was not gonna be the right one for Michael to even join the Bulls. And then it was clear that that Bulls team was not gonna beat the Pistons, right? And get to the final. Then it was clear that that team wasn't gonna beat the Knicks. They keep pulling in different specialists, right? We need a tough guy. We need a rebounder. We need someone who's a ball handler. We need another scorer. And that's exactly, it's just a, 
and any sports team really that's successful is a, is a case study in that. But that's happening on your team too. You need different specialists, different muscles. So we have learned some things about our teams through this. And that would, that's our next breakout question is, what have I learned about my team through this? I'm sure there's people, back to Tracy's shrink or grow point, that have surprised you, right, with additional capability, with some additional calmness, with some great decisions made under pressure. And I'll bet you've had some people who have responsibility on your team who have shrunk in the moment, right, who, who maybe should have, might have uh, done better, done more, been more capable, and they weren't. So let's talk about that. What have we learned about our teams? And we'll set up another breakout, Abby, and I'll stop the, the share here and get into our rooms again. We'll probably be in there with different people, but let's start with this question. Let's do five minutes. All righty. Most people, the people at least that responded, were very impressed with what their teams showed um, during this and what they continue to show. And they've discovered new capabilities there, Tracy. And the other one we heard was someone who uh, they were going to bring in actually as a partner who shrunk in the moment and really unqualified themselves for even this role. And the, and the leader that was sharing this actually changed their mind and changed direction on a person that was going to come in as a, as a professional partner. And we had someone who was talking about not being impressed with their leadership and others talking about being very impressed with the leadership in their organization. We were all over the place. What'd you guys learn? Oh my gosh, those were good. Yeah, ours was um, mostly positive just about, but we did have that that conversation about that it crystallizes you. You either rise to the occasion or you don't, and it's it you can see that easier. Um, but I, what I loved about our breakout is everybody was talking about that it made their team a little bit closer. So there was better communication. Um, it was an equalizer, I believe. Alyssa was the comment she used or some, somebody used um, that it, I do believe that happens in a Zoom call that you know you're staring at someone on a screen and people are more likely to interact. Um, and I, we've actually had that experience where we've had introverted clients that have said, this is, you know, I, I have a voice, I feel like I do, where it doesn't get buried, you know, in a room full of extroverts. And so we had, we did have that conversation. I think you teed that up though, Wally, with your last summary. Well, and there's no head of the table, right? I mean, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. It, it does democratize things a little bit, uh, for sure. So what else did you guys have? Yeah, what other I yeah, I think that's true. I didn't even, I hadn't even considered that. Um, well, listen, the big takeaway of what I heard is that uh, people are communicating better, right? So raise your hand if that is one of your takeaways, just so we can see. Yeah. I, so, so weirdly, you would think that there have been a lot of people that have made the decision to not go virtual before the crisis because they didn't want, you know, they, they felt like people needed to be in a room together to have that communication. And we're sitting here now talking about one of the big takeaways for teams is that we're communicating better. We have more of a voice. So isn't that an unintended consequence, right? That's something that we definitely would not have said going into this was gonna be an outcome that probably would move our organizations forward. And I think for that reason, and you all are watching this too, there are a lot of companies that have made the decision to stay virtual, right? Or to at least give employees the opportunity. And so I know leaders get super nervous about this. They're like, no, 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 we've gotta be in the room together, but let's take this as one of the big learnings that, you know, listen, maybe that's actually prohibiting us from communicating effectively as a team. And I'll say this about this, and that is that anything in excess becomes an irritant. Right. So I would say all virtual would be tough. All physical would be tough. So I think there's got to be that hybrid that leaders need to strive to reach with their teams and organizations so that you can honor both of those things. So that's a big takeaway for sure. Yeah. Well, and you guys, those of you that are, I'm kind of a leadership geek, as we were saying, and, and the futurists have been telling us this for 20 years. I've got a book written in the 80s, Megatrends. Some of you read that book that talked about distributed workforce, remote workers, all this stuff. It was going to happen. It was always going to happen. And we could debate about it, but this has nudged us all into the future that was coming anyway. I think we've just got pushed, COVID pushed us into 2026, maybe 2024. We could debate about that, but that's where we landed. And uh, it's good. I mean, it's, it's a productivity tool and we'll be able to use the best of both worlds later. Uh, there is a time thing. I'm sure you've all noticed it where virtual time is different than in-person time. I, my estimate is a virtual meeting of about 45 minutes equals about a, a three hour in-person meeting. Like it just feels like a lot longer for some reason. Are you all having that experience? It's crazy, right? I'm having it now. <laughs> oh, sorry. All right, let's keep going. All right, so, um, okay, next section. Let's go back to the screen share. I think I figured out how to do this. I'm not, I don't know. I'm not. Oh, I don't know either. I'm, not, I'm, I'm ready with my hard copy. Well, you're gonna be impressed. 
So let me get this going with the slideshow. Current slide. It's better. That was better. That was the faster. Well, I, I deleted the whole first half of the slide, so we don't have to watch it again. So, <laughs> all right. right, take it away. Okay. All right, so the next one is focusing your energy. Um, I think we could all use a little bit of a conversation about this one right now. And it's just, you know, back to the old Stephen Covey, you know, where, where you spend most of your, um, you know, your time and energy. And so as you can see on one of the slides, it's not up and I'll just tell you, there's, there's, there's the circles, if you will. And those circles are around, you know, um, where should you be focusing your time and energy? The first circle of control, which is you, right? The circle of control is that small, piece in the middle that's like, these are the things that you absolutely control. If you say you're going to do something, you need to do it. If there's something that, you know, um, that's important to you and you can affect the outcome that you need to take control of those things. So those, those things in the circle of control, these are just things that you are responsible for. Believe it or not, there are people that will say they're going to do something and don't do it. They've already missed the point of all of this, but the circle of control are things that you absolutely can influence. The second one is the circle of influence, and that is situations or people or teams that you can have a positive impact on. And that circle of influence, if you will, when you think about the teams that we're all on, we're all on this call, we're influencing each other in those breakout rooms, we're influencing each other, you know, maybe decisions that we're going to make in the future. That's the goal. That's the hope is that we can have a positive influence on the people that we interact with on a daily basis. The last circle, that red, big giant red circle is the circle of concern. And that's just Things that you see, there, there are so many things that end up in the circle of concern, but you can't do one darn thing about those things. And when you end up spending all of your time and energy in the circle of concern, you've spent your emotional capital. You have, you know, made some decisions by worrying about everything that will affect your circle of influence and your circle of control. On the next slide, we'll just give you kind of a sense of where do those things end up. So in the middle of the control, attitude, preparation, effort, the things that you are going to get done, that's definitely the control. The influence, how you influence other people, uh, team culture, meetings, if you will, just, you know, making a decision to participate. But how many of you, and this is a question, on that the outside circle, how many of you are spending way too much time thinking about worrying about the pandemic? The corn, all the questions that what, what might happen, politics, the stock market going, you know, all we're forced in a crisis to spend more energy in that circle than we've ever had to spend before. And we have to figure out how to still hold, okay, we need to be concerned about that, that we have to live in this circle of things that we can actually absolutely influence. I, we can we can influence things that are connected to the outer circle, but you can't just sit around and think about you know, oh my gosh, this is the worst thing that's going to happen. I, my guess is everybody knows somebody that's doing that right now. Rightly so, by the way, this is the scariest time ever. But you have to get yourself out of that circle and into the circle where you're actually going to go and start doing things. So here are some ways to do that. Yeah, I was going to say, we all know people yep. just through social networks and everything that are stuck in that outer circle, right? They're spending all of their energy and emotion and things they can't control at all. So do what you can to help those people too. It's That was one of the shares in our group, Tracy, was someone saying they just unplug from the news. They just can't do it and still be the person they wanna be. So um, great point. Listen, so take it away. I remember uh, in the middle of my worst night of COVID watching uh, CNN and the all night coverage. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, my life is never gonna change because that, if you do that day after day after day, there's no way that doesn't begin to paralyze you a little bit for sure, right? All right, so here, here is the leadership focus test. So here's the first question. Uh, can you stay with something until it's done, right? So can you, you know, focus your creativity to solve a problem? Go ahead and just pop them up here and we'll just, I'll just read them all real quickly. Discern between what's urgent and what's important. And I'm gonna put a check mark here because I think a lot of people don't know the difference between the two. You know, um, I work with a lot of teams and a lot of organizations and a lot of leaders that just pull the fire alarm all the time and everything is urgent and everything is important. There's a difference between those two things. If you, you know, the timeless seven habits of, uh, you know, highly effective people that, that kind of goes back to that. But I think you've got to make that distinction and know, you know, there are, there are things that are very different in those two buckets and you have to figure out, figure that out. Next one, hold on to a priority until new things are introduced. Um, this is something I'm not very good at. I'm working on this right now. Like I want to make a decision 
ready, fire, aim. Um, and let's just, you know, start, you know, pounding through that. But sometimes you do have to say, you know what, this is a priority and I need to make sure that I can incorporate things as they come into play so that it can change the outcome. Next one, start with a blank page and finish a plan. How many of you have had to completely go back to ground zero and redo your business plan during this crisis? I can see some of you, wow, even if you're part of an organization, there's been a lot of organizations that, you know, we call it going to the whiteboard. Um, we certainly had to do that as, as an organization and had to step back and say, okay, you know, this is our business. 90% um, of our business, by the way, was wiped out with COVID. So a lot of you know, I get on a plane. Um, our business was built primarily around me speaking in front of uh, companies. I um, mean, the first uh, eight days, I had 18 cancellations. Um, and, you know, in the spring as a speaker, that's your Super Bowl. So you have all the, you know, national meetings. So we sat here, you know, six weeks into to COVID with holy smokes. <laughs> like, you know, this is a, t a total game changer for us. So I think, you know, having that, that you know, blank page certainly, um, you know, is something that, that you have to be able to make that pivot on that. Differentiate the focus stages of ideation, confirmation and completion. Last two, stay attached to your priority over a long period of time. And the last one, here's a question. What are you doing right now? Are you, are you listening and watching this? Or who's on email? Who's texting somebody else on the call? Who's working on a PowerPoint for later? Come on. We do it, right? We all do that multitasking. And so, you know, that ability to stay focused. When, when Wally first sent over the, hey, Tracy, focus is the new IQ. I was like, that's the worst thing ever. We can't, we can't, you know, do that. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing because it's true. You have to be able to, you know, block out some of that noise. Um, you remember that, Wally. I was not excited about that when you threw that over the fence. Yes? It is the new IQ. We all have all the information there is. Uh, focus is the only differentiator between leaders now. So I, I, I'm a believer and I hope we can convince you guys that too, that the ability to hold your mind on a priority. And we were talking about that before the crisis. Now it's even more important. So we agree now? Tracy? Agree. You're on board? Sweet. I'm, a, I'm all on in. I'm all in. All right. Okay. Let's keep going then. Thank you very much for that. So the next key to leading in crisis is to humanize your communication. Uh, and I'll talk about what that means. This is very important for leaders. It's very important for everybody. So being an effective storyteller is a key part of crisis leadership. And we've seen this. We've seen this from our government leaders, political leaders. We've seen this from our business leaders. Those that can tell a story that helps people find the context in this moment are much more effective than the memo writers, right? Stories contextualize information in a way that's transferable, in a way that, again, to use that word, makes it you know, easily accessible uh, for everybody. It's not a time for corporate memos. I've seen some things. We coach a lot of business people. I coach a lot of CEOs and they were, had all their memos and business announcements all ready to go. Uh, and that's not the way to do it right now. The stakes are too high. So you have to humanize them. We'll talk about the steps for that here in a second. Um, so here we go. So here are the seven steps to humanizing and we're all humans. So we start at the right, right place. Communications with employees. You ready? So number one, you have to include the why. Why I'm talking with you today make it personal and not business speak, uh, make it uh, user friendly, right? Number two, your decision making process. If you're the leader, you have to talk through the considerations you had in front of you and exactly how this tough decision was made, right? Especially when it affects them or they think it affects them. Uh, provide that needed context. We're making decisions we never thought we'd have to make. You know, let them see the exposure, let them see the vulnerability, let them see the disappointment. These are happening to you and they're happening to them and we're all humans and we're experiencing this moment together. Uh, a clear explanation of the strategy you're implementing. That's number four. A clear and understandable, I'm going to say user-friendly because a lot of times explanations of furloughs and layoffs and drawdowns and uh, partitioned schedules. I've seen some incredible stuff. Uh, they don't even know what that means and so you've got to make sure that that makes sense to everybody in the, in the community uh, that you're talking to. Clarification and impact. Exactly what this means what is going to happen and what's not going to happen. A lot of times the not gonna happen is the part that people are most concerned about. So you wanna make sure you include all of that in your communication, whether it's written or verbal. Uh, casting your future vision. We're already starting on our bounce back plan. We're already starting on our post CV19 comeback plan, right? That's where you have to start turning the wheel again for the future. And your key message is always gonna be the same, right? We will rise to the occasion. That's what's going to happen. We are going to be one of those businesses that comes out the other, other side even better. And the final thing to remember is, and this is the easiest way to think about it, you're telling a story, right, about a difficult present and a hopeful future. 
at the same time, right? So it pays to be a great storyteller to be able to get that done, right? To get that across. How many of you have seen this done badly in the last two months, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, it's a problem. And so we see it all over the place that our leaders um, we trust on the government side, our leaders we trust on the business side, now's the time to be a, a great storyteller. Can I, can I add something to that, Wally? I just want to say, yeah. and this is an obvious thing, but when you start talking about, um, you know, clarification, impact, being the truth teller, you know, you know, just being authentic and honest with people. Um, I worked with a leader recently and we were on a call and he was saying, um, you know, I just don't want to worry people unnecessarily. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they are already so worried. Nothing you can say is going to make that worry worse what you can do is minimize that by telling the truth. And he said, I know, but some people might lose their job. And I said, well, everybody thinks they're losing their job, but there's only going to be a couple. And this is an organization um, in, in Georgia. And so he was, you know, saying, you know, you're watching the news, you see what's happening with our governor. Like it was just a, a call to me to that, you know, he just needed to tell them the truth. And the truth is he didn't know, right? The truth. And, and so for the first time ever, he goes in front of his organization and says, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen. And everybody was like, oh, okay, well, they can live with that. So I just want to, you know, jump in and say that, that, yeah. you know, sometimes you don't have the perfect ending to your story and you just have to be authentic in that process. Yep. Yeah. And err on the side of oversharing here, transparency wins in a moment like this. Right. And the, the strength that you're building your culture through that is going to be really helpful for you. Your team is coalescing around this and they'll be stronger when you come out the other side. So thank you for that. So the last point is preparing for the bounce back, right? It's coming. There's debate about when it's coming. We don't have to agree on that today, but it's coming. And there are some really practical ways to talk about this. And uh, not all of us, even if we went to business school, got a lot of training in scenario planning, right? So this is the moment where we want to scenario plan. So let's talk through the classic scenario planning language. And it's a beautiful language for scenario planning because everybody understands it. So we're going to use the letter shapes, right? The V-shaped recovery, the U-shaped recovery, and the L-shaped recovery. So those are brilliant because anybody can understand them. I can understand them. It's my first day on my first job back in groceries. At, or we have Food Lion here. I don't know what you guys have for groceries. But. Not food Lion. <laughs> you don't have Food Lion? Harris Teeter? No. Oh, wow. Well, whatever you have. Everybody gets it. So let's talk through what these mean. And this is um, roll up your sleeves kind of stuff. And this is a great context for, for conversations with your group. So the V-curve goes straight down, straight back up. It's a quick bounce back. Uh, in some of your industries, this is already happening. We don't let go of talent. We be ready to make growth decisions, right? We make certain to remember and operationalize some of these efficiencies we gained or some of these efficiencies we discovered, like the virtual thing, right? So that's the V. The U curve stays down for a while. It's a temporary new normal. This is where we're seeing probably about 60% of all businesses are at the bottom of their U starting to curve back up now. Uh, cash is king, right? You guys know that it, those of you that are running companies, you have to make tough decisions to preserve capital, right? You're cleaning up your AR, you're making deals with landlords, you're uh, getting additional credit from vendors, you're revisiting your banks, PPP, all the loans, right? Once these decisions are operationalized, the team is leaner, smarter, and tougher. I know a lot of you are going to come out of this looking a lot different than you went into it. So the L curve goes down and stays down, and all of your decisions have to reflect what is a new reality in your industry or new reality in your business. Leaders have to operate in worst case mode here with survival as the first priority, right? And dynamic leaders move into a strategic discovery stage to totally reinvent their business. Some of you are in this moment. Uh, here's, what's, what, here's what I think is the most savvy way to, to manage through this. And I learned this from Gideon Malherbe, who is the world's number one scenario planning expert, a South African guy. And what he says was just, just act like it's an L. Act like it's an L and with your team, decide on what the triggers are that tell you it's not. So you want to be convinced that it's not an L, not hopeful that, it, that it's something else, right? And he said, and I quote, uh, guesses are for chumps, right? You don't want to be guessing at this. So if you just say it's an L, we're going to operate like it's an L and our triggers to know that it's not are this, this, and this, right? And you know what your triggers would be. They're economic triggers, triggers with your customers and your marketplace. So V, U, and L, great way to talk about it, great way to understand it, great way to plan for it. So with this, we're going to go to our third breakout. And here's the question, and I know some of you have been thinking about this already, is what's never going to go back? What is never going to go back to what it looked like in February and January of this year? And that's our conversation for our breakout. So start thinking about it. So I'll, so I'll start with ours. Uh, we had a couple of really great takeaways. One of them was... Um, 
that a lot of the meetings um, are going to turn into emails. So that was a no. Thank God. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, one I thought was super great. Ruth was talking about it, just that um, you know that we are going to be more valued for our input instead of the package it comes in, right? So that's kind of an equalizer. Was the the, a little bit of the conversation we were having that, you know, it, it is easier uh, to be able to hear somebody um, when you're, you have this snippet of them instead of in a meeting. How about you? What were, what was in your room, Wally? We had, the first thing was uh, some of the things like travel and the way people interact in public and face masks. We talked about how when you travel to foreign countries, a lot of cultures have had the face mask thing going long time before COVID. So maybe yeah. we're, we're in that. Uh, one Matthew shared that he thinks the handshake is dead, which, is probably true. I think we're permanent elbowers or fist bumpers. It's probably better anyway. Uh, handshake got masculinized along the way as well. I don't know if this happens to, to women, but it's a weird little grip thing that I won't miss at all. Uh, what was the other well, thing? Well, it makes me mad when you don't shake a woman's hand. When you, oh, no. Yeah, so when men will shake all the other men's hand and they'll be like, you know, kind of, yeah, so. Will that be true for fist bumps too? Totally. Well, I'm always gonna fist bump everybody. I think, I'm a, I think I've handshaked. Jane misses her hugs. We all need it. Once this is all done, we're all going to get together and just line up for Jane hugs. I think we're, we're ready for that. Uh, that's so fine. It was great. It's really good. My team was, we decided we were a lot better than your breakout group too. It was weird. Whatever. That's so lame. My, <laughs> my, group, my group, we're actually meeting after this. So Sure. We're, we're all getting together for drinks. We're all on a first name basis. All, all right. right. Let's not go back to the deck. Let's just wind it up all right. here and then we can hand it back to Abby. So you want to go ahead, Trace. Okay, so I'm going to wind it up uh, and just say thank you. And just l listen, I do think that, um, you know, crisis management, we could learn a lesson from crisis management and call it, or crisis leadership, call it leadership in general. I, I hope that, you know, w as we go through what we've been through the last 90 days, that we don't go through it and just go, wow, glad that's over. Let's go back to the way things used to be. If we don't take the learnings from this time, if we don't make some changes to stay relevant, I think we're going to miss an opportunity to do a reset. And I can tell you this, we, our business at this point, we actually, um, you know, we've brought on some partners. We shared with you who they were a little bit earlier because our phone is actually ringing off the wall now. We, um, you know, I thought, uh oh, you know, maybe this is going to be one of those things that people won't, you know, be uh, investing in. But I think everybody knows we've got to figure out how to lead through a crisis in a way that keeps businesses relevant on the other side of that. And so I'll just say thank you. Um, first of all, thank you to just everybody for being on the call, but just as, you know, Wally and I, the co-founders of a company that have benefited greatly from the support of the Tulsa community, I just, a, a huge heartfelt thank you. Um, we really appreciate the partnerships. We really appreciate um, just